Thank you for making it to the last panel of the day. I'd like to invite the panel moderator, Jacob Vogelstein, uh, general partner at Camden Partners, to the stage, as well as the four panelists. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so, yeah, thanks everyone for making it through uh, to the end of the day. Um, we have a panel of startups as our final uh, event uh, of the afternoon. And uh, I've been um, very impressed with the, the, the meeting today, a lot of great talks. And uh, these meetings always have a great set of uh, both scientists and entrepreneurs uh, who attend, which is really a nice mix. And so uh, at the end, uh, I, I think in the last few of these meetings, we've always had the opportunity to hear from some of the smaller companies and the folks who are uh, really on the frontier of commercialization in neurotech and aging and, and, in, uh, and in wearables. So very exciting to be able to uh, moderate this panel. Um, I'm going to, the structure of the panel is gonna be pretty simple. Um, we are gonna hear just a few minutes from each of the panelists to introduce uh, themselves and their companies and why the thing that they're doing uh, at the company is transformative for the space that they're in. Um, I have some questions prepared that I'd love to, to hear the answers um, from the assembled uh, group and then I'd love to get uh, audience participation and have you uh, ask questions uh, to all the panelists. Um, so maybe without further ado, uh, we'll introduce our panelists. I'll first just go through everybody who's here and then I'll just, we, we can just go in order and you guys can, can introduce yourselves. Um, so we have Sam Kellett from AWARE, uh, Shahed Azim from React, he's, uh, he's in no particular order, uh, Jinan Booth from Unaliware, and Julia Brown from Mindex. Excellent. So Sam, will you take just a few minutes to tell us a little bit about yourself and about what you do at AWARE? So, uh, yeah, happy to talk about AWARE. AWARE is a custom biometric hearable uh, used for remote brain monitoring. It's all done with this little custom earphone where you can listen to music and, and talk on the phone. Uh, it can also be used for seizure detection, uh, developing uh, biomarkers for neurodegenerative disorders, and also diagnosing uh, sleep disorders. Everybody knows that it's, you know, it's not financially and logistically feasible to remotely monitor the brain, uh, at least not invasively. And in addition to that, uh, the wet electrodes are attached, you know, to the skull, and uh, they can't obtain the, the MTL signal today. So AWARE will not only enable ambulatory longitudinal studies on the brain, uh, but this winter we're, we're entering patient trials with two top research hospitals. And uh, we're going to show how close we get to that, that MTL, and we'll publish those, those results. Um, the AWARE platform is really comprised of, of three different innovations. The first uh, is our 3D ear scanner. That's what enables this technology. It is currently the industry standard for the hearing aid industry. Uh, thousands of these scanners are being rolled out you know, across, the, across the globe. Uh, but the, the 3D ear scan is what optimizes the performance of a sensor. Uh, the second innovation is we've developed dry electrodes um, that uh, we built in situ so you can wear it some 80 plus hours a week like a hearing aid patient. And then the third is we combine digital signal processing with machine learning and uh, biomedical informatics uh, for specific medical domains. And then ultimately we want to tie that to the underlying medicine. So um, uh, to conclude, you know, our, our business model is uh, we're taking a seizure detection product through uh, the FDA in 2020. Um, uh, the, the second thing we do is we currently work with pharmaceutical companies in their inpatient drug trials, um, and we customize our software and hardware uh, for, for their needs uh, and, and their different use cases. And then last but not least, we also license you know, our, our, our platform, and we'll license subsets of it. Um, we have licensed to one of the most valuable companies in the world. They're building a custom biometric hearable using our platform. Uh, we're about to announce uh, a hearing aid manufacturer as well uh, here in the next, you know, couple, couple months. But the goal is to help everybody with a pair of ears, and licensing is the, the best way to do it. So uh, that's our business in a nutshell, or ear shell. Thanks, Sam. Uh, um, very exciting stuff. Jeanette? Oh, I thought you were going to go in your, your order. No, okay. I'll go in a <laughs> linear order now that I know which way you guys are sitting. <laughs> Great. Uh, so I'm Jean Ann Booth. I'm the CEO and founder of Unaliware. And let me first tell you why it's called Unaliware. 
Unali is the Cherokee word for friend, and our watch is called a Kanega watch, which is Cherokee for speak. So we're the friend who speaks to you. And I, I got here after my previous semiconductor company sold to Texas Instruments and Apple. I did totally get the, the semiconductor talk before. Um, but I did it because my mom was turning 80. And um, so what we actually do with the Canega Watch is we provide discrete support for falls, medication reminders, and a guard against wandering with Guide Me Home Assistance. Of course, it's a speech interface. You talk to the watch, it talks to you. And then we have artificial intelligence that learns the wearer's lifestyle. So nowadays you would say like a Nest thermostat, except for, for people. Uh, back in 2013, I gave it the very unromantic name of user-specific big data. But that was the way I wrote the patent. Um, we are actually in market today, uh, the first generation Canega watch. Well, the watch has in it cellular, Wi-Fi, GPS, Bluetooth for hearing aids, we need to talk, yep. and telemedicine devices. And then, um, of course, that continuous speech recognition and then the artificial intelligence that is, is running in our cloud all the time. The first generation watch was this one. Uh, came out in 2018 uh, for the market. We have wearers across the U.S. today ranging in age from 16 to 100. So although we started out being senior focused, we, we also have um, other independent but vulnerable populations that we work with. And one of the most um, parts of that that I'm, I'm proudest of is actually our Parkinson's population. So when we did our medication reminders, everything we do, we UX first. And when we did um, medication reminders, we had some Parkinson's patients in that group. And they, um, to, to a person, came back to us and said, I just had the best doctor's visit I've ever had since my diagnosis. And I actually attribute that to my Canega watch keeping me compliant to my medications. And the reason for that is because we have a patented battery system in the band that means you never take your watch off to charge. So it's there to help you on the senior side when they're most vulnerable to falls in the bathroom at night and for the Parkinson's folks with a really complicated medication regimen 24 hours a day. Very cool, thank you. Uh, next we have Shahed Azim. Perfect, so um, my name is Shahed Azim. I've um, been a s early stage serial entrepreneur. I've spun out a couple of companies from uh, labs at MIT uh, across a few different areas. Uh, over the last uh, year, I've been collaborating with um, three neurosurgeons uh, and uh, neuroscientists from MGH. Uh, Dr. Rudy Tanzi, who's the vice chair of neuro, uh, Brian Nahed, and uh, uh, Dr. Sean Patel, uh, who's faculty here. And, and our vision for, um, uh, for React Neuro is really to build a highly scalable, uh, quantified sort of a brain health platform that's focused on digital biomarkers. Um, so the sort of the emerging future that we're seeing is that uh, a lot of things in brain health, even now, uh, well, uh, absolutely now, tend to be very reactive. Uh, and we've seen a major shift in things like oncology and cardiology, uh, seminal studies like the Framingham study that have essentially pushed um, the care paradigm to much more uh, proactive and preventive care. And so we see a real significant opportunity and a need to build a highly scalable platform um, that focuses on um, being able to predict and prevent some of these very serious conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and uh, other forms of dementia. Um, and so we set out about 18 months ago building this uh, uh, platform that uses a, sort of a multimodal approach. So we're looking at these micro changes in your I, uh, using cameras and a VR system. Uh, we're looking at voice analysis and changes in your voice analysis. Um, and um, some of this work has already been published through um, uh, sort of a postdoc at MIT and a, a lab at BU, uh, which was widely picked up. And you know, a lot of this stuff uh, has been in the public domain in the last year. Um, and so what we're trying to do is build a lot of these pieces in a, uh, like I said, a very scalable system. Um, and I know there were some, uh, there was a fantastic talk earlier around uh, by Roche um, around the value of these digital biomarkers. And, um, and so what we're doing is uh, focusing not just on acute cases like TBI and concussion, but also chronic. So 
Uh, we're working with some um, senior living facilities and uh, the sports concussion clinic at MGH uh, are in uh, late stage of validation of our platform. Thank you. And then uh, last but not least, Julia Brown from Mindex. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Julia Brown. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mindex, a uh, neurotech AI uh, early stage company uh, recently spun out of uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University and uh, a lot of uh, many years of DARPA work. Um, my background is uh, computer science and some uh, genomics uh, research back, uh, back in the day academically. Um, over the last few years, uh, I've spent a lot of time um, you know, kind of following my uh, passions around creating really, uh, you know, deep technical solutions and then using those to solve practical problems and always kind of in the middle of that is finding, uh, you know, a good economic solution to bring that to market with, uh, you know, minimal regulatory burden and also, you know, a, a cost that can burden that is, uh, you know, works for consumers. Um, so, uh, you know, did a partnership with Apple around, uh, you know, remote seizure detection, that sort of thing. Um, so at Mindex is kind of the, uh, definitely the most exciting thing I've ever worked on in my life, um, is <clears throat> kind of the result of many years of work in uh, DARPA's revolutionizing prosthetics uh, program, um, but basically we're uh, bringing to market a uh, non-invasive brain-computer interface um, to basically uh, let you, uh, you know, for the first time ever have, you know, kind of ubiquitous neural control um, and interaction with uh, computing systems. Um, so our, we're focusing uh, really uh, on consumers in a way that I think is maybe a little different um, from most of the talks uh, so far today, which have uh, really had a medical device um, focus. Uh, but we definitely also see um, one of our earliest um, you know, kind of uses of the product is certainly as an accessibility tool uh, for those with uh, mobility uh, impairments in particular. Um, so we uh, recently finished a prototype with our partners at the Applied Physics Labs for Johns Hopkins um, of our uh, optical imaging system, the brain computer interface hardware itself, uh, as well as uh, a lot of different software around computer vision, uh, the uh, neural networks, uh, deep, deep uh, learning models uh, for the neural signal processing, um, and uh, raising our uh, first big round of capital now. So uh, yeah, my day job when I'm not moderating panels for Lisa, I run an early stage venture capital fund and uh, we invest in deep technologies spun out of academic labs around the country. And so uh, it sounds like uh, all of you are in various stages of the, the, you know, the inception of the companies and growing uh, rapidly in some cases. Um, but I'm curious, you know, uh, many of the technologies that, that we've heard about today and that you've all mentioned in your I introductions have potentially dual uses, both as consumer devices and or uh, medical or clinical uh, devices. We heard from Carlos Pena, who I think is not here anymore, uh, about some of the challenges in the regulatory landscape with some of the new wearables and other things. So I'm wondering if, if maybe um, you can tell us a little bit about when you were thinking of the technology, how you made the decision to, to pursue either a clinical or a commercial uh, focus and, and why you made that decision. And maybe for a parody, we'll start in reverse order uh, with Julia. Uh, sure, so I alluded to this a little bit um, just a moment ago. Uh, but actually, you know, kind of uh, around the founding of the company, my co-founder, uh, Jeff Ling, is a long time, uh, you know, uh, neuroscientist, neurologist, and, uh, you know, uh, founded DARPA's biological technologies office many years ago. Um, so we, you know, kind of came from this shared uh, place of having worked, you know, in healthcare, um, and you know, really wanting to solve those problems. Um, uh, the challenge around, you know, kind of working out that business model for a brain-computer interface uh, is that, you know, you're charging uh, potentially just to, you know, uh, make back the money on a clinical trial, uh, you know, around 350k at a minimum uh, for someone with late-stage ALS, uh, you know, for this device, uh, and that really puts you in, you know, kind of a a difficult spot for whether or not you can feel really good about, uh, you know, putting every hour of your life into that company. Um, so, you know, with a bit more, uh, you know, creative thinking around that and, uh, you know, a few more months of work, um, you know, we're able to, you know, come to a point where we can, you know, create a non-invasive, you know, consumer first solution um, with, you know, with the uh, potential um, to either partner with someone to bring that to bear uh, with its medical applications, but basically to get through all the hard work of validating a product that then has many use cases outside of that. Um, so I definitely find, you know, like uh, constraints make uh, engineering fun, uh, while it is also certainly challenging. Uh, so I definitely think um, that, you know, kind of this 
time frame we're in right now is particularly exciting. Uh, I was talking with some people earlier about, you know, uh, digital health op opens all these opportunities um, to create, you know, economic models uh, for new businesses that can really uh, both kind of, you know, exploit, you know, markets that haven't really been touched um, by, you know, traditional silos and also to bring something interesting to bear. Perfect. So, um, so I guess if you look at our team, we have a strong um, sort of a bias for, um, uh, solving hard clinical problems, um, but at the same time, if you um, so one of the things that we've uh, recognized is that um, certainly the the hard science and the clinical validation that's required um, for things like Alzheimer's and others, um, you do need a fair bit of data um, before you're going to go out and start engaging with FDA, and so um, our platform inherently being software is agnostic to some of the, um, uh, essentially can be taken into a few different applications. Uh, so we're doing things like um, taking some of our offerings as a neurocog assessment platform for uh, markets like uh, uh, senior living. Uh, we're engaging with uh, sports teams on managing brain health in a much more scientifically, clinically meaningful ways. And so, uh, so I think uh, there is a natural sort of attention between wanting to go and scale uh, data for real clinical validation. Um, and that's why I think, uh, uh, you know, as a software play, it's certainly an interesting and, and a much more flexible way to sort of uh, think about go to market for us. I'm so glad you asked this question. <laughs> and it's a shame the guy from the FDA is not here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Since my background is electrical engineering, I came into this because my mom turned 80. Um, and so with, you know, with her background and with what we did together, the goal was extending independence with dignity. Certainly seniors were a big part of that market, but it's also other independent but vulnerable populations. And as an engineer, it's been a little bit frustrating, I'll just be honest with you, that um, we can build things that I am not allowed to build. And, and that, that's, you know, I'm, I'm so jealous when I get to sit with the researchers and they talk about the things that they've created and I'm like, gosh, I wish I could do that. But I'm not gonna raise the extra 15 million to do that. Um, so um, in our particular case, because what we do, we are, we are considered class two emergency services, statutory exempt, okay? So we're connected to three of the largest medical alarm call centers in the United States. That's non-negotiable in my perspective because I built this for my mom and I knew if she was to call or text me at two o'clock in the morning, I wasn't gonna pick up the phone because it's on silent. But the medical alarm call center is still there all the time at any time. But because we're connected to the medical alarm call centers, that's what gave us the class two designation. So if I added any physiological sensors whatsoever, including the ones that I desperately wanted to add, and it's not the obvious ones, but there are some that make a really big difference, especially for the, the senior demographic, any of them would make us class three, full class three. And I get the, I get the mission, I get it, um, but it's been, it's been a real challenge. And of course, everybody's like, well, you could just do that anyway, but you know, hey, mom was already 80, so how much longer was I gonna wait to solve the problem that I came out of retirement to solve? So that drove us to um, a consumer product. Um, we are private pay, we're not covered by insurance, um, and we're still class two emergency services and intentionally statutory exempt. All right, so um, great question, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, the, we didn't rehearse this, by no, the way. No, we, so we did not, all, uh, we did not. So it's all organic. Yeah, yeah. so um, I, I license hearing aid because, and I don't know if you know much about the market, but it's an oligopoly. You got six companies that control 92% of the market, three are in Copenhagen, okay? So, uh, by the way, every hearing aid is manufactured for 60 bucks, wholesale for 650, retail for 2100. And they all control their distribution, uh, either directly or indirectly. So anyway, didn't want to fight the oligopoly, license it. Then we licensed to uh, Logitech for custom and inner monitors. So all rock stars, they own ultimate ears. So all rock stars are using devices made from our 3D ear scanner, but the highest and best use is a medical device. And, you know, seizure detection, that market, a um, couple hundred billion dollars, you know, we charge $10,000 a device. Uh, you get to phase three in a drug trial, that's 2,000 units, right? So, you know, it is, and then there's so many other 
uh, medical domains you can focus on and leverage the hardware. Just got to change the algorithm and, and the sensors potentially too. So yeah, it's the highest and best use. Another thing is, is getting through that inertia of having to go get scanned, right? Will you do it for a custom headphone? Maybe. If you're uh, refractory, <laughs> you're, you're going to do it, right? Fascinating. Um, yeah, thank you for that. But th this really is truly unrehearsed, so I'm fascinated <coughs> by the answers as well. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, so uh, there's a bunch of wearables, one software product in this, uh, in this lineup. Um, and, you know, I, I think a lot of the folks in, in the room being uh, in Cambridge, uh, there are a lot of folks here who are scientists and engineers, and we always have the most fun solving the hard technical problems. Um, but, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs, you all uh, have to solve a lot of non-technical hurdles to actually get this thing to be successful. Like, you know, how do you get people to wear your very cool but maybe not very attractive uh, product or the first generation or where do you put the on button or... Mm -hmm. How to get somebody to pay for this thing. So I, I'm curious, and I think the audience would be interested to hear from each of you, uh, maybe what was the most interesting non-technical problem you've had to solve okay. along the way to get to your, your early uh, prototypes? You, 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 we don't have enough time to answer, <laughs> answer that. Um, you know, I mean, uh, the biggest challenge for us is, I mean, if we had to, I mean, it took $20 million to develop the, the scanner. And I did that through, you know, through licensing. Um, which also gave us a customer and a royalty stream we could we could count on, but you had to get out of the kind of out of the valley of death to do that right you 're a prototype you 're trying to license to get a market and to get a, a partner um, that was uh, some some fancy fancy footwork uh, to, to to do that but once we had it, um, then the key is just getting the right partners to really pull you into it and and not try to not try to force it. I love the way you think, because these are great questions. <laughs> um, so for me, the understanding the human impact behind what we're doing kind of started in the very beginning because of the first conversation I had with mom when she turned 80. I, I showed up with a spreadsheet of all of the solutions, you know, pendant, 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 and then the first remote monitoring solution. And, and mom looked at me and she goes, don't you get that from me. I'm not wearing it. <laughs> I was like, okay, got it. Um, and so that actually um, created us, and with my mom, who was our senior user experience advisor. Um, you got that, senior user? Okay. Um, that actually created a whole bunch of focus groups that we did all across the US, like over 400 people. But what was really behind them, we would talk about the Canega watch, but what was really behind them was trying to understand the human bits behind. And, and there were, there were some really cool insights that I'll, I'll share with you guys. Um, the first one was, you know, understanding wherever you are in life right now, right, it doesn't change when you get old. So just because you're 80 doesn't mean that you see 80-year-old you when you look in the mirror. You see 50-year-old you. And if you're 50, you see 30-year-old you, right? It doesn't change. So from the outside, somebody's going, oh, my God, she is so old. In the inside, I'm going, hey, I'm going to go do a half Ironman tomorrow. What do you think? <laughs> right? And that does not change. And that's the biggest human impact behind what we do. You know, all the manufacturers are giving everybody these really ugly solutions. And there is nothing about being old that says, I want ugly. Because, you know, you're still thinking that you're that younger person. And, and you, still have your, you still have your pride. You still have all of the, the vanity right, that, that you had back then, you just have it now with a few more wrinkles. And, and that's super important. And the, the, the second one is, um, especially in the segment that is the silent generation, you know, when Pew named them the silent generation, it was kind of, one of their watchwords was always, you know, you just don't talk about it. And that was kind of how they became the silent generation because they just always talked about the happy things, you know, leave it to beaver and everything like that. Um, but, but really what was behind it is privacy. So if we had to rename them, we would call them the privacy generation. So above all, especially if you're doing any kind of data, they need to know that that's going nowhere because it's nobody else's business. And that's so important. Between those two things, that's why penetration of medical alert products, in my humble opinion, is less than 6% of the population that could be getting a benefit from actually being able to be independent and safe. 
good lessons in that for all of uh, all the entrepreneurs out there. Please. So one of the core things that make us unique and sort of we spent a lot of time over the last year was we went into the published literature around neuroscience and we looked at all the tools and techniques and exams that historically um, have been part of these published uh, basically papers and neuro neuroscientists have used to, to generate a signal of interest for a whole host of these clinical conditions. And um, so with that sort of first principles up effort on building the platform, we're pretty confident on our ability to generate that signal. That's already been sort of proven in uh, uh, sort of over the last four decades. Um, what makes us unique um, and also I guess uh, what, what is the core challenge, uh, the non-technical challenge is really about the execution piece. So how do you take this platform and then you're able to scale data, you're able to build these clinically meaningful application stacks and connect to the healthcare system in a meaningful way. And um, the good news is that we seem to be timing this in a way where there are existing reimbursement codes, uh, there's some new guidance that just came out for uh, next year around uh, digital, uh, uh, digital sort of exams for concussion. Uh, and there's a whole host of sort of groundswell around uh, reimbursement programs. Um, actually, last month there was an article, uh, actually an op-ed by the last four U.S. Surgeon Generals pushing for um, across-the-board uh, neurocog assessment for not just people over 65, which is covered under insurance, but also people uh, just generally, which should be part of your annual physical. So it's really creating that baseline when you are healthy. Um, that enables you to sort of, you know, uh, take actions to stay healthy fundamentally. So I think from uh, a key challenge point of view, it's really about sort of the go-to-market. Uh, healthcare is complex, and uh, we're looking for partners at this point to make that sort of a little easier for us. Um, so we definitely have a lot of challenges ahead of us, um, certainly as a, you know, an ambitious young startup. Um, I don't know that it's almost hard every time I think about all of them. They seem technical a little bit at the end of the day. I would say uh, probably, you know, the biggest, um, you know, area we're always questioning ourselves on is around, is certainly around the user experience and the user adoption of a brand new, fundamentally transformative uh, type of hardware and type of human interaction. Um, so, you know, kind of where we're starting with that is um, we're creating, you know, the world's first brain-controlled smart glasses. Uh, the idea is that, you know, we can uh, take a lot of these small mundane tasks that we do every day, looking something up, you know, searching for, you know, when is that uh, restaurant across the street, what, what hours is it open, can I make a reservation? Uh, if we can take all these small, you know, steps that we all do, you know, by typing them out on our phone, every day and just, you know, kind of replace them by, you know, kind of completing that transaction just by knowing where your eyes are and knowing, you know, a specific volitional uh, signal from the brain at that point in time. We can then just display that information uh, right to you on your smart glasses. Um, and uh, that is something that feels intuitive and exciting to me, the idea to basically just take Google off the internet and just put it everywhere. Um, however, that is something that needs to be validated with a lot of people who have a lot of different uh, perspectives and have grown up in you know, different environments and have different uh, intuitive uh, search modalities um, and just uh, you know, kind of myself and our small engineering team. Um, so you know, we've, uh, it's also not somewhere that there was a huge body of research that you can really build off of. Um, so we're definitely um, looking at you know, new ways to scale a lot of our prototyping and piloting um, so that we can both leverage um, you know, existing problems that need to be solved um, in verticals where there are big enterprises who really uh, are well motivated to solve them um, and use that as our kind of test ground to collect um, good data on how people use this technology and what's most valuable to them uh, for our own uh, product long term. Yeah. So. Um I'm glad there's a hand up because I wanted to call on audience questions either for the whole panel or for individual uh, companies and then I'll have a closing question. So yeah, and we'll repeat your question if we can hurt.
Can you, can you synthesize and repeat that question for the audience? So the question is uh, essentially how do we solve the problem of scaling data both from a specific use case as well as normative, right? I think, did I? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's a core challenge. I think any uh, uh, applied sort of uh, data science or applied machine learning um, yeah, we in- don't have the data. So it's not about comparison the data. Yes. Like So um, I'll maybe pick on that same thread, which is um, there was a study published recently around looking at uh, uh, sort of I think the 7,000 recordings as part of uh, the Framingham study um, over a period of 12 or 13 years. Um, and so the, 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 the MIT student that was essentially, that, that was sort of a part of this publication looked and tracked these uh, patients over, over a 10 year period and uh, was able to sort of come up with digital biomarkers with a fairly high degree sort of um, accuracy to predict neurocog decline over, over that period. So, so I think that's one piece. So do we have proof points is one question. Do we, um, the question is like how do we, how are we able to scale both normative as well as sort of population scale? And, um, and I think that's where we have sort of a multi-tiered approach. So uh, one of the things that we've realized is that uh, let's say we take concussion for, for, as a use case. What happens in concussion uh, is episodic, it's acute, and it's, uh, it's fast. So it happens sort of in a four week period. But a lot of the learnings can be applied to things like um, uh, Alzheimer's because a lot of the same symptoms, the neuron inflammation uh, that happens, happens over a 10 year period. So I think there's a lot of cross learning in some of these neurodegenerative uh, sort of use cases around brain health where um, the fast acute chronic uh, can be cross-referenced and we can do some interesting things. And that's one of the reasons why we're, um, we, part of our offering is into uh, senior living for neurocog assessment. So there are low friction channels where we're looking at scaling some of our data collection effort. Sorry? Can I add one thing? Yeah, yeah. sure. So, so actually, I would, I would challenge you to think a little bit further um, Finding the digital therapeutic piece of that, okay, so the digital piece is new, but the other pieces are not. So like what Constance said before is she started talking about, you know, the models for breast cancer and, and how abysmally poor they were. The same thing exists in, in my world with respect to fall detection, right? There is no golden set of fall detection data, and the unfortunate truth is when people fall, especially among the vulnerable demographic, they have a tendency to get hurt. So you're not really gonna be running a clinical trial about that sort of thing. Um, and so, so you end up having to create that way that you're still collecting data while you're doing the best good that you possibly can do. And, and that's what we all end up doing, like for instance, in the case of fall detection. Um, we um, wrote our seizure detection algorithm by leveraging EEG recordings from 10,000 epilepsy patients. So this is hundreds of thousands of hours of recordings. And so I recommend you, you work with the bioinformatics departments who have access to that, that hospital data. Uh, and other questions from the audience? No, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so the question was, um, the Canega watch is sold out, so what's next for you guys? Um, and so that, that's true. The 3G cellular version of the Canega watch is sold out. Uh, what you see on both of my arms here is the champagne gold and rose gold versions of the LTE Canega watch, which is in pre-sale now and will be shipping at the end of this month. We're at FCC right now. $59.95 a month. You don't pay for the watch. Unaliware.com slash order now. <laughs> Well, actually, <laughs> that actually is a, a good segue because we have to wrap up pretty soon. I know we have our uh, 
drink session afterwards and be a good time for socializing. Um, uh, on that note, so uh, everyone here has built at least prototype, has sold. Uh, some of you have already begun sales, licensing. Uh, you know, whenever you're at the beginning of a new industry, I think we all have to root for everyone in the industry because there's, you know, clinician education, there's consumer education, uh, there's investor education, and every success really uh, begets more successes in the, in the field. So I'm wondering as, as we go off from today and into the rest of our lives and we think back to this panel, when will, it, when, when, when will you know that you're successful? You know, before you sell the company or IPO, in between now or then, what do you think the major sort of turning point will be for each of you where we can see some news release and say, oh yeah, I remember when Sam told me, when you see this in the news, that's when he know he, he made it. What do you think that will be? Uh, when my wife stops making fun of me, okay? <laughs> not sure that's gonna be in the news. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm gonna take out an ad, right? In the Wall Street Journal, right? No, so uh, it's unit sales. You know, I know where we need to be, and I mean, you know, you closely watch the value of your companies, um, and you can you can tie it to that, um, and so understanding your value along along the way. So we know what it's going to take to to get public or optimize our value, and and having smart people like yourself stay on top of entrepreneurs uh, helps in that in that department. All right, so we'll keep, a, we'll keep track of how many units you're shipping. That's right. That's right. Is, that, is that the same for you, Gina? Uh, mostly. Um, the, the other way I would look at it, too, is when everybody's talking about it. Um, like, like um, I think 2020 is the year where, based on what I'm getting from our channel, we do a little bit of direct-to-consumer sales, but frankly, I don't do all that many. It, it mostly goes through the channel. Um, and uh, what they're talking about uh, is 2020 is going to be a really big year for us. So... Knock on wood, um, we'll see. So <clears throat> I think for us it's um, sort of impact and the way we look at that is uh, fundamentally we see a future where you would walk into your PCPs or primary care office and um, the five minutes that you spend getting your blood pressure taken, your temperature, weight, there's no checkup for the neck up, right? Uh, why not? take another minute or two to establish your uh, brain health baseline. If we can move that needle, there are roughly about 38 million people who are yet, who are, who are asymptomatic today, but are on track, just in the US, uh, to have uh, Alzheimer's in late stage. So if we can move the needle and delay the onset of that kind of a condition uh, <coughs> at scale, uh, that would be success for us. Um, so I think for us, it's certainly um, also sales. You know, the health of the company financially is uh, definitely you know, very critical. Um, I think I would also say, um, you know, somewhat personally, um, you know, even anecdotal feedback, uh, you know, from users, uh, just that this has reduced, you know, some, you know, friction in their lives, has made it, you know, possible for them to, you know, Skype their daughter for the first time, you know, without help from another human being, um, regaining independence and, you know, feeling, um, uh, you know, just more empowered uh, to, you know, access uh, information um, would definitely, uh, you know, make me feel that I had done, uh, that we had done a good job. Well, um, I want everyone to thank our panelists, and um, with that, we'll conclude the, the session, and we'll go to drinks. Lisa, is that right? Yes. Thank you all.